All right. All right. No falling asleep here. I know it's the ocean air. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably should see the ocean before the sun sets. I just I need to wrap this up. Let's pray. <laughs> Um, I'm glad that you were willing to stay because what we're going to talk about um, right now is, for some of you, maybe something you have never, ever, ever heard of, if, ever preached in our church. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound very different, unusual. But as we go through it, I believe it will make sense to you. I believe that in many ways, it will have answered questions that you actually didn't have enough courage to utter but your heart has always questioned. And so I'm hoping that we'll be able to, to have an answer that satisfies uh, this afternoon. Uh, please pray with me again. Father, thank you again for trusting us with your spirit as we delve into your word. We just want to thank you for the journey we've had so far. Um, we're looking forward to what you're going to share. Let us experience the encore of Calvary. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who... Uh, um, enjoy the catchphrases, the, the more traditional Adventist catchphrases. Um, what we have basically done so far is we have gone through two of the three angels' message. And you didn't know that, but we have. We've, we've talked about worship. We've talked about who we worship, who we know. Uh, we've also talked about coming out of Babylon, right? You guys have heard that clearly. Uh, often uh, I've had members tell me, Pastor Henderson, you don't, you don't do enough of Three Angels' Message. I said, I preach Three Angels' Message all the time. I just never call it three, the Three Angels' Message. Just don't say it. But we're always preaching the Three Angels' Message. We always should. In every sermon, there should be an element where we see the true person of God, which is the first, the first angel's message, right? So worship is not simply bowing down. Worship is ascribing worth. Being able to say to somebody, I know you, I get you, I see you, all right? That's the first angel's message. And then the second is always to come out of Babylon, come out of your brokenness, come out of systems that are actually destructive, that are falling apart. And this is really critical as we delve into this afternoon's topic, is to understand that Babylon cannot stand on its own. It's impossible. It will always come crashing down. The, the, the devil's government is not sustainable. Sin, if left unchecked, will implode. Just happens. The wages of sin is death. Without God ever having to lift a finger, the wages of sin is death. The only reason why Adam and Eve were able to walk out of that garden is by the grace of God. The only way. The only way. So we're in Revelation uh, chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And if you don't mind, because of the nature of, um, the nature of this topic, I'm going to use a good number of quotes from our Adventist literature because I know for a number of people it is hard to be convinced just from the Bible alone, especially when you're raised with an Adventism. You, you need the corroboration of what we call the spirit of prophecy. And so I will be using a number of, of, of quotes from uh, Auntie Ellen. Um, so just be aware of that. Again, I don't use her as an authority uh, on Scripture. I never have. I, I use her as she is asked to be used, and that is the lesser light that leads to the greater light. Uh, I've always seen her, and she's, the way she's always aided me in my spiritual walk is she has pointed me to things that were already in Scripture that I just didn't see on my own. And I go, oh, there it is. Thank you. The lesser light that leads to the greater light. And that is what we always should be. Amen? Every church, every pastor, every priest, kingdom of priests, we should be lesser lights that lead to the greater light. Um, so the third angel's message, you guys are familiar with this. It said a third angel in verse 9, chapter 14 of Romans, verse 9, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image, and receives its mark on their forehead and on their, on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's wrath, his fury. They too, which has been poured in full strength into the cup of his wrath. 
They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment, in verse 11, the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, for anyone who receives the mark of its name. And this calls for the patience and endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. The third angel's message. Wow. Man, you don't hear that one preached a lot in our churches today, do you? We, we're, we're told to preach the three angels' message, but the third angel's message is pre, pretty, pretty, um, pretty fearsome, pretty graphic. The smoke of their torment ascending before God's throne forever and ever. This is for anyone who receives the mark of the beast, the ones who choose not to worship God. This is their fateful end. They will be destroyed with an everlasting fire. In Revelation chapter 20, we're told that, that these individuals are before the throne of God, and they're judged by their deeds, and they're thrown into the lake of fire. This is how sin is overcome in the end. This is what we have, we have been raised in our church as, as understanding, and this is what we call the justice of God. Now, Adventism did something that... Um, made it more palatable. Adventism came along with, uh, alongside another school of thought of, of a annihilationist that believed that in the end, all of wickedness, all of evil, all of it was completely annihilated. Although God destroyed it with fire, he did so for just a period of time. And then it was completely consumed. Root and branch, according to Malachi. Root and branch, completely destroyed. So Sister White, who when she was young, grew up in a, in, a, in a faith system that believed in forever being burned for eternal torment, this was a shock for her that there was actually a cessation to the torment, that there would be an end. And most of us, again, have accepted this as the mercy of God. He would never torment anyone for days or years or, again, what's unspeakable forever and ever. But here's my problem. As, as a young man, I began to read this, and I thought to myself, even burning for five minutes doesn't sound merciful to me, right? As I got even older, <coughs> I realized that the way the body is designed, the fire is so hot that it actually singes your pain cells almost immediately. Most people that die being burned at the stake died from smoke inhalation. They couldn't breathe. Most people dying in a burning house die from smoke inhalation. They cannot breathe, and they die. Those who survived fires don't actually feel the pain of what the fire has done to their body until their body begins to regenerate its cells. And that's when the pain is unbearable. The body is designed to only take so much pain, and then it shuts down. Which makes this very interesting. To burn for any duration of time would mean that God would have to work a miracle in order for us to suffer. Think about that for a second. <coughs> Ellen White, in early writings... She is told about this experience, and I'm going to share this with you because this has shaped most of Adventism, and it's interesting that it comes at the very beginning of her ministry. She says in, she says in early writings, and this is taken from uh, page uh, 294, she says that Satan rushes into the midst of the followers and tries to stir up the multitude to action. But fire from God out of heaven is rained upon them, and the great men and mighty men, the noble, the poor, the miserable, are all consumed together. I saw that some were quickly destroyed. I saw that some were quickly destroyed while others suffered longer. They were punished according to the deeds done in the body. Some were many days consuming, 
And just as long as there was a portion of them unconsumed, all the sense of suffering remained. Did you guys hear that? As long as there was just a portion of them left. In other words, if there was a fingernail left, they'd still feel it. If they had a toe left, they'd still feel it. Even if it was severed from their spinal cord, which is where our brain receives the message of ouch from the nervous system, all hardwired through our, our, uh, our body. Even though the central nervous system is completely consumed and there's just a finger left, she's saying all sense of feeling will still be there. And she goes on to say, said the angel, the worm of life shall not die. Their fire shall not be quenched as long as there, there is the least particle for it to prey upon. Satan and his angels suffered long. Satan bore not only the weight and punishment of his own sins, but also the sins of the redeemed host, which had been placed upon him. And he must also suffer for the ruin of souls, which he had caused. Then I saw Satan and all the wicked hosts were consumed, and the justice of God was satisfied. And all the angelic hosts and all the redeemed saints with a loud voice said, Amen. Said the angel, Satan is the root, his children are the branches. They are now consumed root and branch. They have died an everlasting death. They are never to have a resurrection. God will have a clean universe. Hmm. I read this when I was 15 years old. It was scary. I'm going to keep it real with you. I didn't want to feel this. And like many Christians, I decided that I better make sure my stuff was together because I didn't want to suffer this in the end. How many of you decided you were going to make, this is going to sound traditional, traditional, you're calling an election sure. Make sure that you were right with God because you didn't want this to be your end. Anybody here wanted to avoid this? Hmm? Want to be on the winning side? Absolutely. Hell. This is what is described in Revelation. But I want to present to you something that may sound a little bit emotional, but I want to actually paint this picture in a way that is a bit more visceral. Often when we look at hell, it has become so spiritualized, so sanctified in many ways that we actually don't see it for what it's really communicated in our teachings. If we see hell as punishment, if we see it as justice, this means that God is going to make sure that all wickedness reaps what they have sown. My problem, pastor, is that I've been taught that Jesus bore the sins of the world. Anybody else believe that? That means that he bore the price, the penalty of all sin. So you're telling me not only does Christ bear the sin of all of the world, even Hitler's and Nero's and Pilate's, all the ones that nailed him to a cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Not only did he bear those sins, but at the end of time, those who actually did sin and didn't want to live with God, they have to bear it as well. So now we have two punishments for sin. And then on top of that, because Satan is the main culprit, he then is going to pay a third time for all of the sins. So we have a triple payment for people sinning. Can I ask you a question? Does that sound fair to you or just? Anybody? Does it sound just? It's okay if you nod your head no. It's all right. And you're afraid of saying it's not just because you're afraid you're going to say that God is not just. It doesn't sound just. It doesn't sound just that you have a triple payment for sin. Now, someone might say, but pastor, sin is so offensive to God. He must make sure it's completely eradicated. Here's my problem. We learn today, according to the Laodicea church, that God disciplines those whom he loves, right? He disciplines those whom he loves. Now, here is the problem. The problem is, is that discipline is corrective. Discipline 
has a purpose. Discipline is about creating a direction that is healthy. If I discipline my son, it's because I'm wanting to correct behavior that can actually harm him, right? It has a purpose. If I do not love my son, then I would create no boundaries for him. But because I do love my son, I give him boundaries. The reason why God, we know for a fact that he loves us, even in Exodus, is because of the laws and the discipline he provides. It creates order. For children, they say, if children want to feel safe, you create boundaries. When you have no boundaries for your children and there's no discipline, it actually creates unrest in your kids. Because they do not know where the boundaries are. They do not feel secure when there are no boundaries. So God shows his love in the boundaries that he has created. If you look in the Garden of Eden, there are boundaries there. When he tells Adam and Eve, you are to work six days, but rest on the seventh day, those are boundaries. But those are good boundaries. Because if Adam and Eve did not have the direction of how they should work and what is healthy working, not overworking, but healthy working, and how to have a weekend, they would be unhealthy. They would eventually tear down. They would eventually break down. He tells them not to eat animals. Right? He tells them what their diet is. That is also God's way of showing them how much he loves them, right? All these things he gives them. He even allows them to listen to the enemy, the serpent, who's in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right in the middle of the garden, not in the corner, not surrounded by cobwebs, but in the middle next to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, I mean, the tree of life. It's right next to it. He has no problem with the conversation between the serpent and Adam and Eve because it's okay to dialogue and to disagree. All he tells them is this, don't drink the Kool-Aid. If you vote for him, it leads to death. I'm just keeping it real with you. I'm not going to put parental lock on the cable. I'm going to trust you at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to trust you with the keys of the car on the coffee table. I'm telling you right now, don't do it. So all of this stuff, all of this stuff is going on. God has created certain boundaries to let them know that their life in paradise will continue to be healthy and successful, happy, all the good stuff, if they learn to abide by the blueprints that God has laid before them, right? So when it doesn't happen, when they do not obey, when, when clearly they decide to uh, 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 allow the enemy to be now the new ruler of this world, right? Because you know Adam and Eve were first the rulers of this world. They then turned over the rulership to Satan, and he became the prince and ruler of this world. Once they turned it over to them, they were introduced for the very first time, violence. For the very first time, they were introduced to bloodshed. It was never a part of God's universe at any time. Think about this for a second. God had never even shed the blood of Satan when he rebelled or any of the fallen angels. God had never killed anything in his life. It was Satan that introduces this. And now for the very first time, they now are seeing life and death. And from this point on, God is trying to communicate with his creation the relationship between sin and death without actually having them experience the full impact of sin. From this point on, according to Revelation, what they're doing, what God has been doing is holding back the winds of, of, the, of strife. If God had allowed Satan to have his full sway, if he had allowed uh, sin to run its full natural course in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve would have died. What happened? You voted for him? I'm out. I'll see you guys later. Actually, I'm not going to see you later. Bye. But all throughout the Bible, it is God holding back the winds of strife. Anytime he inserts himself in a disciplinary role, it is out of love. Sister White says in, in Prophets and Kings, in the story of Nineveh, she says that every time God would overthrow a city, every single time, she says, he did it in love and mercy to the city itself. And also in love and mercy to the other cities that were impacted by the sin. Because what we don't realize is that even people living in wicked cities didn't like living in wicked cities. Nineveh was called the city of blood in the book of Nahum, the city of blood. However, even though it was wicked, and again, the city of blood, Nahum said that, that, that people would walk over dead bodies just to go from point A to point B. That's a terrible place to live. 
So although they were living, they weren't living well, right? Can we, can we acknowledge that? Even though they were physically alive, they weren't in a happy place because even cities at war or cities in conflict with God's person, his character, his laws, aren't happy doing so, right? They're not happy doing so. So, so, so Nineveh's not happy, and neither are any of the cities that are impacted by Nineveh's sin. So God would check them. And so he steps them and says, in 40 days, I'm putting an end to this mess. But this is how Nineveh handled it. They repented. They repented. And once they repented, God had no need to do anything more because they changed. So God said, okay, we're good for now. We're good. So anytime you see God stepping up in the Old Testament, anytime you see God flexing, anytime you see God saying, all right, I'm going to let you do it your way so you can see for yourself and you can see that sin gives you lots of owies. All of it had a purpose in disciplining, in teaching, in correcting, and making a point that was hopefully going to be transformative. Here's the problem at the end of time. At the end of the time, at the end of time, nobody's learning any lessons. What are the wicked going to learn? It can't be called discipline anymore. What are you going to learn? Oh, yeah, I won't do that again. Oh, yeah, you won't do that again. What are you learning? It can't be punishment. And we just read 1 John 4, 18 says there's no fear in love for perfect love. Cast out all fear because fear has to do with what? Punishment or torment. So if, if God is love and there's no fear in love and there's no fear in love because fear has to do with torment and punishment, what is happening at the end of time? Is it God making sure he gets them back? And some people will say, but pastor, yes, they deserve it. They have sinned and they did not accept God's grace and mercy. They rejected his gift. So they basically said they want, they want to pay for their own sins. Okay, well, if that's the case, if God wants to pay them back for what they did, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that's Old Testament, right? Why won't he nail them to crosses? The ones that nailed him to a cross, wouldn't it be just if Jesus nailed them to, nailed them to a cross as well, right? Would that be just? Is that just? It's just. But can you imagine Jesus nailing somebody's hand to a cross? But you can imagine him burning them forever or burning them for 10 hours or for five minutes. How about the one who murdered people through drive-bys? Can you imagine Jesus and Gabriel getting into a car and driving by and shooting them? Or about those responsible for six million deaths of the Jews in, in, in in the time of uh, Germany's power, would, would it make sense for God to grab Hitler and kill him six million times and say, that's what you get? Is that just? Oh, no, it is just. That is just. Making sure somebody gets exactly what they pay out is absolute justice. But you're shaking your head saying it's not just because in your mind and in your heart, you know it doesn't sound like God. It almost even sounds petty. Well, you threw a rock at me, well, I'm going to throw a rock at you. See how you like it. But we've sanitized hell by simply saying it's fire and they're going to feel pain and they're miraculously going to survive it because God needs to make sure they get what they deserve. The reason why I asked you to look at Revelation through the eyes of the early church is it's important for you to also see how they look at some of this imagery. And because most of us are not around it and never have been around it, a lot of it escapes us. So let's go through some stuff here. First and foremost, some of the things that Sister White talks about in that quote in early writing, she talks about the worm that dieth not. Turn with me to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. We're going to find out some things about this stuff. Isaiah 66. It's the very end. At the very end. Isaiah 66. And you're going to read some stuff that you, <laughs> you've read before, you just didn't see it. But we're just going to use scripture right now, Isaiah 66. Let's see what God says about the final destruction. So <clears throat> the Bible says here, starting with, um, starting with, uh, uh, let me get down here. Starting with verse 22, it says, As the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord, Isaiah 66, verse 22. It says, so will your name and your descendants endure. From one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will do what? <clears throat> Come and bow down before me. 
says the Lord. And they will go out and look on the dead bodies, verse 24, and they will go out and look at the dead bodies, and they will go out and look at the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. What jumped out at you? I think I kind of made it easy for you, but what jumped out? Dead corpses. So the unquenchable fire and the worm that dieth not are consuming what? What are they consuming? Corpses. Not people who are alive, corpses. Because for the people during that day, how did you purify a battlefield of corpses? You burned them. It was sanitary. You couldn't build a bunch of graves. You burned them. And so the imagery here is unmistakable. They know what this is. It's a battlefield. And the wicked have lost. And they're being consumed, purified with fire, not being burned alive. And, and the worm that dieth not, please, do not believe in fire retardant, retardant worms. They don't exist. The, the fact of, huh? Not to mention worms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so you have to understand that there's, there's, a, there's a way in which God communicates something that is going to sound so simple. And I'm just going to say it to you like this. He, what he's saying is that they're not just dead. They're dead, dead. They're not coming back from this. <clears throat> Their worm is not going to die. The fire will not be quenched. Like, don't even be afraid because they had seen enemies burned on a battlefield before. And those enemies come back, not the ones that were burning, but but they're, 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 they're from their country, the other nation, they would say, we're going to send in reinforcements. We're going to send more people from our nation. So they had, they had grown accustomed to saying, yes, we won this battle, but there's another one on the horizon. So this was a way of communicating, your enemies are gone forever. Like, they're not just dead, they're dead, dead. Are you guys seeing that? But one thing you for sure can see is that they are dead. When Christ begins to uh, imagine what the end time will be like, the destruction of the wicked. He uses a couple parables. One is the wheat and the tares. He talks about the wheat and the tares growing together. And then what happens? The sickle comes and it, <clears throat> after full maturation, the sickle comes and it cuts out the tares because you can clearly differentiate between the tares and the wheat. You cut the tares out. And then he says you bundle them up and you throw them where? In the fire. Question, when do the tares die? When they are cut, that is when death occurs. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who do not bear fruit, those who do not bear fruit are like a branch that withers away. Such branches, in John 15, such branches are bundled up and tossed where? In the fire. When does death occur? When they wither away. And why do they wither away in John 15? Because they're not connected to the vine. Does that make sense? Very natural. Anyone listening to Jesus would say, oh, yeah, we get it. And that which is dead is tied up and then thrown into the fire. And both of, and all three of these illustrations, is anything alive being burned? Not at all. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Now, understand that in, in Revelation 14 and also twice in chapter 20, we get descriptions of how the, the wicked are destroyed. And at the very beginning of chapter 20, it says that the wicked try to take over the city. They try to overcome the city. And when they try to overcome the city, uh, fire comes down out of heaven and destroys them, comes out from, from God and destroys them. All right. Uh, as we go on in the chapter, verse 7, um, I'm sorry, verse 11 we get another description of what will happen. It says in verse 11, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. There are some that say there was no place for them. It was referring to the heavens um, that fled, and some say it refers to the people. And I saw the dead and great and small standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. 
the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Question, anybody alive? They're referred to as the dead, the world of the dead, the grave. It says then, verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. What is death? Is death a person? What is Hades? Some would say that Hades is actually hell, the world of the dead. It's saying hell and death are thrown into the lake of fire. Now, remember what we said at the very beginning? John will tell us what these uh, illustrations, what these symbols mean, or Christ will tell us, right? If there's any mystery, we will be told what it all means. So John's about to drop the knowledge right here. He says that after he says that death and Hades are thrown to the lake of fire, the lake of fire is the second death. It is the second death. Does he say it caused the second death? He says it is the second death. The lake of fire is symbolic of the second death. The lake of fire is symbolic of the second death. This is what God uses to describe forever being cut off from God. A lake of fire. Sister White, after early writings spends the rest of her life writing on this topic. And interesting enough, she never, ever expresses it the way she did in early writings, ever again. And I believe, as we talked about earlier today, this is just maturity in the Word. I think when God first dealt with Sister White, she was coming out of a mindset that believed people were tortured forever and ever. And I think it was too much of a leap for her to see it any other way. So God found a way of communicating it in such a way that she could grasp it and even receive it. But as time went on, God unfolded more to her. When we talk about truth, it's always unfolding. He unfolds more to her, and she shares in such powerful ways. You guys ready to listen to some of this good stuff? In Desire of Ages, she really starts to paint this picture of what the cup of God's wrath is, what we read in Revelation 14. This is the cup that Christ asked to be removed from him, that he had to drink in full. This is taken from <clears throat> Desire of Ages, page 753. You guys ready? It says, the withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in his hour of supreme anguish, right? The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was his agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. It wasn't about the cross. Christ was experiencing pain on a whole other level. This is why he says, no one takes my life. I give it up and I'll take it back. The cross did not kill Jesus. That he died on the cross is actually in many ways inconsequential. The cross never killed Christ. Even Pilate said, he's already dead. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. He could not see through, see, see uh, uh, he could not, he did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of his sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Because that's hell. Christ felt the anguish. Listen, Christ felt the anguish that the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for a guilty race. Did you hear that? What Christ felt on the cross is exactly what the sinner will feel at the end of time. Now remember, she says it was an anguish so great the physical could hardly be felt. So you think at the end, as they're suffering, there's gnashing of teeth, God is like, oh, you think that one hurts? Well, why don't you take a little bit of fire? To go with that pain. This is what sin does. This is what God was warning us of long ago. It was the sense 
of sin, bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. The wrath of God is not God drawing near. The wrath of God is him respecting our choice to be forever separated from him. That's right. Paul says in in Thessalonians that hell is to be forever separated from God. That's what hell is, to be forever separated from God. Let's continue on. This is uh, page uh, uh, 759. She says, not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or the unfallen world. She says that he had clothed himself with deception that even the holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. It was, it, was being a, it, was, it was a being of wonderful power and glory that had set himself against God. And she goes, on, she goes on to say, he had stood in the light of God's presence, he had been the highest of all the created beings, and had been foremost in revealing God's purposes to the universe. After he had sinned, his power to deceive was more deceptive, and the unveiling of his character was more difficult because of the exaltation position he had, been held, he had held with the Father. So in other words, because he was esteemed so much by God, it was hard for people to even see him as being evil. For the longest time, he's God's sidekick, right? He's the Robin to God's Batman, Right? All right, she goes on. She goes on to. She goes on to say, um, um, God could have destroyed Satan. Watch this. God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth. Right? She says he could have done this. However, rebellion was not to be overcome by. Force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love. Not compelling power. She says, she says, God's government, sorry, yeah, his principles of mercy and love. And the presentation of these principles is the means to be used. God's government is moral and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. What's the prevailing power? Love and truth. Truth and love are to be the prevailing power. It was God's purpose to place things on an eternal basis of security. And in the, in the councils of heaven, it was decided that time must be given for Satan to develop his principles, which were the foundation of his system of government. He had claimed that these were superior to God's principles. Time was given for the working of Satan's principles that they might be seen by the heavenly universe. Page 762, still a desire of ages. This is the chapters, It is Finished and um, Calvary. They're great chapters. God's love has been expressed in his justice no less than his mercy. Did you hear that? When we talk about God being just, we always feel like it's another brand, like, yeah, God's loving and merciful and he's gracious, but, you know, he's also just. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. God's love has been expressed in his justice, no less than in his mercy. Justice is the foundation of his throne and the fruit of his love. She says justice is actually the fruit of his love. So it's never like, yeah, I love you, but, you know, I got to punch you too. She actually says that justice, God's justice, is a fruit of his love. This is why I always tell people, don't think that God is just in the way that you see justice, because he's not. Because Calvary's not just. It's not. It's merciful. It's gracious. All right, let's continue. She says, she says that uh, uh, it had been Satan's purpose to divorce mercy from truth and justice. He sought to prove that the righteousness of God's love is an enemy to peace. But Christ shows that in God's plan, they are indissolubly joined together. The one cannot exist without the other. Mercy and truth uh, are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That's Psalms 85, verse 10. She continues on. We're in page 764 now. She's talking about the destruction of the wicked. This is not an act of arbitrary power. This is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. The rejectors of his mercy reap that which they have sown. This is important, family. It is not something that God arbitrarily does. It is not God arbitrarily judging. It is not God arbitrarily saying, you're bad and you're going to get it. That is arbitrary. She says it's not arbitrary at all. They reap what they've sown, meaning that whatever they experience is something that they have put into it. 
has nothing to do with God or what we call his justice. The rejectors of his mercy reap what they have sown. God is the fountain of life. And when one chooses the service of sin, he separates from God. Right? Those who remain in me, I will remain in them. Right? Those who do not remain in me are like a branch that withers away. She says, he separates from God and cuts himself off from life. He is alienated from the life of God. Christ says, all that hate me love death. God gives them existence for a time that they may develop their character and reveal their principles. This accomplished, they receive the result of their own choice. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence in him is a consuming fire. Now think about this for a second. Out of harmony with God, that his very presence is a consuming fire. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. We're not done yet. At the beginning of the great controversy, the angels did not understand this. Had Satan and his host been left to reap the full result, important. He keeps using this word all the time, result, result, not punishment, not discipline. If they had been left to reap the full result, the natural consequence, right? The full result of their sin, she says, had they been left to reap it, they would have perished. But it would not have been apparent to heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. A doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds as an evil seed to produce its deadly fruit of sin and woe. In other words, had, had, had Lucifer and his host said, you know what, God, we never want to see your face again. We don't want to live with you. We're done. We're cutting ourselves off. And they slammed the door. And as soon as they slammed the door, they died. Everyone in heaven would have been like, oh, no! Who would they have blamed for the angels and Satan dying? Oh, Lord, I lift your name on high. I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad. Right? That's what they would have done. And God would have said, no, 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 I didn't kill them. Yeah, you did. No, they slammed the door and they died. You had to have killed them. No, no, it's because they were cut off. Yeah, right, God. What does that mean? He needed them to be able to see, the whole universe to see, this is what sin produces. In fact, the only reason why people live is because I keep holding back the winds. If I let these winds go, man, everybody be dead, including Satan. Right? And we're going to see what it's like when he no longer holds the winds back, okay? We're just, we're, we're, we're patient, we're patient, right? So this is the reason why God did not destroy Satan at the beginning, because it would, have, it would never have been understood. In other words, they would have followed God out of fear. So this is why I tell people, our, sometimes our doctrine of hell is just as scary. We're, basically just, we're, we're just basically saying it's not happening at the beginning, it just happens at the end. In other words, yeah, don't fear God in the beginning because, you know, because he could have killed you, but he didn't, so don't fear him. But in the end, if you don't like him, you don't love him, he will kill you. Just want you to know that, right? Can you imagine somebody saying, I would love for you to marry me? Really? Yeah, I would love for you to marry me. And just so you know, if you don't marry me, I will kill you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, wait, I'm sorry. Wow, wow, wait a second. This just got weird. No, no, but I really love you. I love you so much, I'd actually die for you. Okay, can we just stop talking? No, no, I just, listen, listen. I love you so much, I would give my life for you. But just know this, if you do not love me in return, I will kill you. <laughs> now, I'm willing to die for you, but just know if you don't love me, I will kill you. <laughs> And I'm not just going to kill you. I'm going to torture you and then kill you. How many want to be friends with that being? Anybody want to be married to that? Not at all. So we got to be, we got we to gotta remember, we got to remember that often we are sending our young people messages that are contradictory. And listen, they can't articulate it because they don't really know what's really happening in the, in the confusion of their spirit, their mind. But, but this is what they can't, they can't vibe with. It's hard for them to accept that God loves them and also wants to crush them. For them, God is unreasonable, and he's arbitrary, and he determines who's good and who's bad. And in the end, he's going to prove that he has more power by killing those he says are bad. All right? This is how I, I tell people all the time, if you God is on trial... He can't be the own judge of his trial, right? He can't be. So either we are the judges, and he's on trial, or he's the judge, and we're on trial. You can't have it both ways. 
So in this situation, God is basically saying, I want you to know I have nothing to do with the consequences of sin. This is, this is another government whose compelling power, whose compelling uh, uh, force is power. He always uses power and intimidation and fear and coercion, and that's not my government. But often we have attributed the government of Satan to God. We have made God the hero and the villain in the same story. The one that we run to, save us, Lord. Yes, come to me. I love you. I will save you. Keep running. Keep, keep running or I will kill you. Keep running. It doesn't make sense. There's a couple, there's a couple other uh, passages here that, that she has that she talks about. Uh, Jesus' heart being broken by his agony, and this is taken from uh, Signs of the Times, an article, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna keep on going here. Uh, oh, boy, this is a good one, too. This is, this is a good one. This, is, this talks about what, what, it, what, experience, what Satan experiences at the end of time. She says that Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. Just, just put a pin there, unfitted him for heaven, because we're going to get back to that that his rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. Did you guys hear that? He has gotten to the point where he is so alienated from God that the very presence of God, that the, the peace and harmony, the purity of heaven would be to him supreme torture. She says... She says, his accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now silenced. The reproach which has endeavored, that he endeavored to cast upon Jehovah now rests wholly upon himself. And now Satan, she says, and, she, and this, is, this is pretty much, she uses almost word for word in the great controversy. She says, and now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. She says in great controversy that he's constrained to worship God in this moment. This is where we read in scripture, every knee bows and every tongue confesses. They get to the point where even, even those who are disconnected from God say, you the man. <laughs> wow. You're amazing. And we'll paint the picture why. Now, she says for Satan, it'd be a place of supreme torture, right? It'd be a place of supreme torture. Now, watch this. She says, and this is the steps of Christ. In his sinless state, man held a joyful communion with him, right? A communion with God. But after his sin, he could no longer find joy in holiness. And he sought to hide from the presence of God. This is what happened with Adam and Eve, right? Such is still the condition of the unrenewed heart. It is not in harmony with God and finds no joy in communion with him. The sinner could not be happy in God's presence. He would shrink from the companionship of holy beings. Could he be permitted to enter into heaven, it would, find, it would have no joy for him. The spirit of unselfish love that reigns there, every heart responding to the heart of infinite love, would touch no answering chord in his soul. His thoughts, his interests, his motives would be alien to those that actuate the sinless dwellers there. He would be a discordant note in the melody of heaven. You're getting the point, right? Heaven would be to him a place of torture. He would long to be hidden from him who is its light and the center of its joy. It is no arbitrary decree on the part of God that excludes the wicked from heaven. They are shut out by their own unfitness for its companionship. The glory of God would be to them a consuming fire. Now remember this. The glory of God is what? What do we know the glory of God to be? The character of God is his glory. So she is saying that the glory of God, the very character of God, would be to them a consuming fire. Now, when we always see glory as bright light, we think, again, yeah, they'd be in his brightness, and the brightness would just burn them up. You're missing the point here. The point is God's character is so alien to what they do, how they feel, how they operate, that to be in his presence and to live in his kingdom, it would be a place of torture. So if God wanted to torture the wicked, where would he send them? Hello? Hell? Oh? <laughs> Listen to what she says here. They would welcome destruction. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. 
This is why when we read in Scripture, when they see him come in the clouds of glory, they cry out for what? To fall on them. When they see Jesus coming again, they're not crying out for life. They are crying out for Because to live with Jesus would be supreme torture. If God wanted to make the wicked suffer for everything they would do, he would say, go to your room. (laughs) And you go there and think about what you did the last 40 years. But I don't want to live with you. I don't care. I paid for you to be here. You're going to live in your mansion, like it or not. But God, I don't even like you. I don't care. I like you. Now go. (laughs) Because power is not God's compelling force in his kingdom, he will not force anyone against their will, even though he's already forgiven them. According to Romans chapter 5, I'm going to turn there real quick. Romans chapter 5. We're, 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 about to, we're about to wrap up. Oh, there's so much good stuff. Ugh. I know we'll have a chance to do a Q&A, I think, next, right? Is it? So Romans chapter 5. Listen to what... Listen to what uh, I was just talking with Lori about this um, after, after lunch. We were talking about it's not our decision to be born into sin. We didn't decide to be born into sin. We didn't. We didn't. No one, no one had a vote that they, they wanted to come to planet Earth, right? Nobody in their right mind would vote that, right? All right? So, so, so Paul is acknowledging that because of one man's sin, death through sin came to all people because all have sinned. That's in, and so in verse 13, I'm sorry, down to verse 15, it says, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Verse 16, nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, Just as the one trespass resulted in condemnation for how many people? All All people. He then goes on to say, he goes on to say, so also one righteous act. How many righteous acts? By which person? You? Jesus, right? Only one who is good, rich young ruler. Only one who is good. Only one who is righteous. So also one righteous act resulted in the justification and life for how many people? All All people? How about the people that just love him? How about the remnant? All people. All people is all people. It's everyone. Everyone has been justified. Everyone has been justified. Absolutely everyone has been forgiven, including Nero, including Pilate. But pastor, they didn't repent. They didn't ask for forgiveness. God doesn't need us to be repentant in order to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Are you listening? Forgiveness is not dependent. True forgiveness is not dependent on somebody apologizing. Right? Are, you, are, is, are, are we clear on this? Amen. You've been asked to forgive even your enemies, even though they didn't come up to you and say, hey, I'm really sorry I did that. I know I messed up and I'll never do it again. We've been called to forgive those who harm us, who hate us. And if God has called us to do that, he himself does the same. So everyone is forgiven. Everyone is justified. The price was paid for every sinner, every sinner. Romans chapter, Romans chapter 4, the chapter before, says, I, I, I quoted this, uh, this morning, but I want you to read it. I want you to read it. Verse 5, I'm sorry, verse 4 says, Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift but as an obligation. However, verse 5, however, to the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly or the wicked. All right? Their faith is credited as righteousness. So God justifies the wicked. He justifies everyone, everyone. The Bible says in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 19, that through the death of Jesus on the cross, his blood shed, that everything was reconciled, whether on earth or in heaven, everything. So at the end of time, it doesn't come down to who's a bad sinner, who is terrible, who's awful, who didn't repent. It comes down to one thing. Who's going to be happy living with me? 
And who's going to think it's hell to live with me? What it comes down to. It's already been paid for. You, everything's been paid for. So I'm just trying to figure out who wants to, who wants to remain connected to me for the rest of their lives? Who wants to remain in me? And there'll be those that be like, heaven, yeah. And there'll be those that say, hell no. Are you listening? And those who say that, hell, no, are still forgiven. It's not like Jesus says, oh, okay, well, I'm going to take this pain that I paid for them, and I'm going to give it back to them. He already paid for it. He's not going to take it back. He died for everyone and reconciled everything on earth as well as in heaven. Sister White said there were some angels that had not yet made up their mind until the cross. Until the cross. We read it already. It wasn't, it wasn't clear to many of them until the Calvary. She says, we are not to regard God in selected messages. Page 235. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result. Every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character, and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result is ruin and death. I'm going to read one more thing to you. This is taken from Great Controversy, page 673. Sister White now, towards the end of her life, has the chance to go back to that early writings quote and quote it again and say, I just want to double down on this. As long as there's the least particle left to be consumed, all feeling will be left. Watch what she says here. And you find it actually in Revelation as well. She says that um, notwithstanding that Satan has been constrained to acknowledge God's justice and to bow to the supremacy of Christ, right? He acknowledges, again, you demand. She says, his character, however, remains unchanged. Remember, heaven to him would be a place of supreme torture. The spirit of rebellion, like a mighty torrent, again bursts forth. Filled with, the frenzy, he de filled with frenzy, he determines not to yield to the great controversy. The time has come for a last desperate struggle against the king of heaven. He rushes into the midst of his subjects and endeavors to inspire them with his own fury and arouse them into instant battle. But of all the countless millions whom he has allured into rebellion, there are now none to acknowledge his supremacy. His power is at an end. The wicked are filled with the same hatred of God that inspires Satan, but they see that their case is hopeless. They cannot prevail against Jehovah. Their rage now is kindled against Satan. And those who have been his agents in deception and with the fury of demons, they turn upon them. Did you hear that? With the fury of demons, they turn on Satan and his agents. She then goes on to say, the wicked receive their, re their recompense, the recompense in the earth. They shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord. She says, some are destroyed as in a moment, while others suffer many days. She then goes, she then goes on to say, uh, all are punished according to their deeds. The sins of the righteous, she says, have been transferred to Satan. He is made to suffer not only for his own rebellion, but, all, but for all the sins which, which he, has, he has caused God's people to commit. His punish is to be, punishment is to be greater, is to be greater than, that, than that of those whom he has deceived. After all have perished who fell by his deceptions, he is still to live and suffer on. In the cleansing flames 
The wicked are at last destroyed, root and branch. Satan the root, his followers the branches. The full penalty of the law has been visited. The demands of justice have been met and heaven and earth beholding 